So there is a relationship uh, between the people and the law. And I do believe that if we have a, a sufficient concentration of freedom-oriented people here, we'll be able to move things in that direction. And hopefully that idea, those concepts, would spread to other places also. Can I suggest another alternative? Yeah. And that is an Article 5 Convention of States could propose amendments that would roll the powers of the federal government back to the original enumerated powers in Article 1, Section 8 and get them out of our pockets and our schools and our, you know, mm -hmm. medicines and everything else that, that should be a state issue alone. So the suggestion was an Article 5 Convention and that's, that suggestion is gaining in popularity. Um, that would be a uh, kind of revisiting of the U.S. Constitution. I've heard a lot of people make that suggestion, and I think you would probably find some healthy debate here in this room about that. I don't know that we necessarily need to get into the details. Some people believe that that would be an effective method, and um, I would agree if the overwhelming consensus amongst Americans and their representatives were to do that very thing it's a little bit of a Pandora's box, because if you open that up and the consensus is more big government, it could go the other way, which could potentially be dangerous because it opens the door for the Supreme Court then to say, oh, well, the Constitution now says you don't have the freedom of speech, therefore, sorry. And uh, so I'm a little bit concerned about the risks. Now, sometimes you have to take risks in life. Um, but, but that's certainly one that you'd find maybe some debate about, well, is this a good idea? Is this not a good idea? Um, from a from a mechanical or, or technical standpoint, certainly that would be a legal option that could be effective if the conditions were right. And now I got to completely change the subject. Talk about local government. There's five functions in New Hampshire local government, right? Safety, sanitation, infrastructure, records, and recreation. What's the as a free stater? What's the position on? on those functions? Should some of them go away, or is that about right? Do, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, so the, the question is, what do free staters think about the functions of local government? And I think, again, there's going to be diversity of views among free staters. You know, some would say, privatize it all. Right? We find ways to have um, private nonprofits or for-profits handle all, all of those things. Um, I think, you know, my own view is that some of those could probably be privatized, but, um, you know, I, I like to say I'm for kind of median-sized or right-sized government at the local level, small government at the state level, and tiny government at the federal level. So I, you know, I, I think there are definitely efficiencies that can be found in local government, especially in education. Um, but that's not a local government responsibility. It's, it's a school board responsibility, which is an, a special purpose local government. You could you could call it that. Correct. Right. Yeah. But you know the Keene City Council, for example, that's has right. no say in education. That's right. Yeah. Um, so so I'm not I'm not uh, in favor of abolishing local government. I'm not um, you know uh, I, I think uh, there's a lot of choice among local governments in New Hampshire. Right? So you can move to a local government that does less if that's your preference. And so I like that. And I think maybe we can enhance ways of you know, maybe make it easier for neighborhoods to form you know, their own little communities that can handle things in a different way. So give people more choices across the range of uh, local institutions. And if you do that, then I think it becomes less uh, you know less important what local government does because it will tend to do what the people living under it want right I, I would uh, yeah and I would echo this sentiment that there's probably a wide diversity of views even here in this room but it, but but also outside of this room there's the overwhelming majority of free staters and you'd probably find everything from abolish it all to leave it all and uh, things in between and I live in Keene so I, I guess there's others here who live in Keene. I'll give you my personal take, and that is that, um, that well, let's see, before I do that, there's, there's a difference in, in maybe the way some or many libertarians think from the way that some or many um, kind of non-libertarians or, or regardless of political philosophy, people who don't think about politics a lot think. Uh, a libertarian would be inclined to think let's say starting from zero, that is, let's imagine uh, a blank slate now 
building from nothing what sort of government would make sense, whereas many other people would tend to think in terms of the status quo. So we're going to start with where we are right now and what changes would we make. And interestingly enough, where you start thinking has a significant impact on where you end up. So if you, if you, if you get rid of the, the baggage of the status quo, you may end up with a different answer than if you accept that and then consider how do we change it. Um, so I tend to think, I, I'm able to think in terms of the status quo, but I tend to start thinking in terms of, of uh, starting at zero, what would we build from nothing? And then, how do we get from the status quo to there? Um, safety would be one, or public safety, I'll be more specific. Public safety would be one where I might admit there there's, could be some role for government. And when I say public safety, I'm specifically referring to ways in which people can act that will infringe on other people's rights. So uh, those, are, those are areas where maybe a local jurisdiction might have some legitimate authority. If you're doing something that is unsafe such that it endangers your neighbors, then um, that's not an especially libertarian thing to do, and for a government to protect your neighbors from your dangerous behavior might be a legitimate function of government. Recreation, on the other hand, might not be. Uh, record keeping might be something where a, a uniform standard would be important uh, within a jurisdiction, but the functions could be outsourced, you know, like property uh, uh, record deeds and things like that. So it may be that you know you can record your deed wherever you want, put it on the blockchain, but it has to meet these um, uh, standards so that when there are disputes uh, in cases of law, they can be settled in a in an efficient way, something like that. So I would have a kind of a mixed answer to your question, and I think if you pulled the room, you'd find several other takes on that as well. Other questions. Um. So I believe the, the Free State Project is now, is it 80 or 85 percent of the way to its goal of signers? So in that sense, it seems that the Free State Project is coming to an end in the sense that there will no longer be a, a central goal to the project. Um, what exactly is the future looking like in that sense for the group, whether it's the corporation or the activists, um, doing things under the name of the Free State Project? Is that actually going to end soon, or is it going to continue or morph into something else? So, so the Free State Project, and it's currently about 80, 87%, I think. The Free State Project's about 87% of the way to the goal of 20,000 participants. Um, it looks like it might be coming to an end. What's the future for the Free State Project, either the activists or the organization itself? Um, do you want to answer that question? You're still on the board. I'm not anymore. Yeah, so um, actually, think about half the board. Uh, this takes a lot of our time, and it's unpaid and all of that. So I think half of our board says, as soon as we hit 20,000, I'm out. <laughs> so, that, so that's, um, uh, that's going to happen in maybe two years, maybe less. Uh, uh, so the Free State Project as an organization is going to start winding down. Now, I think we need to stay alive to get, you know, when you sign up, you agree to move within five years after we reach 20,000. So I think we should stay alive for the next six or seven years for those 20,000 people to move here. Um, but it is definitely winding down, and who knows, 10 years from now, will people even use the term free stater because there will be a free state project. Right, so what, what do you call the people who moved? Maybe it's not even um, in, the, in the lexicon anymore. Uh, we're all just kind of granite staters doing our, doing our thing. Um, so yeah, the, the free state project has a, has a time limit. It's not, you know, it's not gonna do the March of Dimes thing and say, okay, now we're gonna do something totally different. Um, it is going to, going to wind down. And, and one of the nice things is, regardless of what the organization does, um, which, which really has kind of rights to the name and the database of people, and that's just about it, um, the Free State Project doesn't have any members. There's a trifold handout, by the way, and, and we gave that to all of you to illustrate the kind of thing that we would pass out maybe in an event or something like that to show what the marketing materials look like. And I think it mentions in there, in the participation guidelines, it says explicitly, the Free State Project does not have members. There are no members. Um, there are no dues. So it's all funded by donations, mostly from individuals, um, almost exclusively, I think, from individuals. And uh, so if somebody doesn't like the Free State Project, they just can simply stop saying Free State Project or stop you know, clicking on the URL or stop donating money or whatever. Um, so even if the board goes off the deep end, that doesn't really affect me. I just live here now. Um, as far as whether or not we call ourselves free staters, 
I guess that's up to us. I, I don't have a um, real strong opinion on that, but I do, I do think that the formal effort of we've got to 20,000 and then now there's five years to move, I think that's kind of the logical conclusion of the project. If it, you know, if the board says, oh, let's have a second free state project, I don't know, whatever, I'm gonna stay here. That's my answer. Is it true the Koch brothers are funding the Free State Project? <laughs> Is it true the Koch brothers are funding the Free State Project? Um, you have more recent data than I do, uh, but this accusation has been levied for many, many years. And I can tell you from uh, my time on the board, and actually ours, ours overlap. Jason was off the board for a while while I was on it between about, what, 2009 and maybe last year. Um, and, and this, the straight answer up until last December was directly no, and indirectly the Koch brothers fund everything in the world, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, we haven't got a dime from Koch Industries, uh, Koch Foundation, their nonprofit. Um, we haven't got a dime from any foundation that I know of, uh, or any large corporation, or any government. Uh, we're almost exclusively small individual donations, 25 to $100, uh, you know, uh, that, that's where our funding comes from. We get a um, small share, like maybe five to 10% from small businesses, uh, but the vast majority is from individuals. And, and by the way, just as a follow-up to that, the idea of funding the Free State Project, there's a, there's a like does the Koch brothers fund the Free State Project? Um, Scale is something that's worth noting. The Free State Project has raised and spent less in its entire existence since 2001 than many noteworthy organizations raise and spend in one year, some in one quarter. So it's not that the budget is some enormous thing. It's a small budget and a small, all, for most of its history was all volunteer. Uh, occasionally we would contract out things like PR, graphic design, stuff like that. Um, and only within the last couple of years have there been any kind of paid staff, if you will. So uh, even if the Koch brothers funded it exclusively, it's not a big amount of money. Uh, Rich? Has somebody reached out to the Koch brothers? Because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah we, would, we would love to live up to their accusations. <laughs> Some of all those guys. <laughs> Hey, I, I would take uh, I would take their money for my nonprofit, which is educational and more up their alley. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Mark, could you compare and contrast the success the Free State Project has had in its lifetime, or you know, participants in the Free State Project have had inside of New Hampshire mm -hmm. in their lifetime uh, for the small amount of money that has been raised from the Free State Project versus, say, the Independent Institute or the Cato Institute or one of these large organizations that raises more in a quarter than we have in our, our lifetime. That's a great question. Matt. Efficiency is important. Right? Yeah, I'd like to answer that question, actually. Um, first, you have to restate it. I'll restate it first. Can we compare and contrast the Free State Project with other pro-liberty organizations on the basis of what each raises? You know, the Free State Project having a tiny budget and maybe uh, you mentioned, I guess, IHS, uh, Cato, et cetera, et cetera, having huge budgets and what's the effect been? So uh, the short kind of overview answer is the Free State Project is a hundred or million or billion or gazillion times more effective than any other pro-liberty organization on the planet uh, in the history of pro-liberty organizations. Now, that's um, first of all a true answer and second of all it's not the whole story. So what actually the Free State Project does is a little tiny piece of the puzzle. It encourages people who are libertarian or pro-liberty activists to move to the state of New Hampshire. So the Free State Project's budget is small and the Free State Project's activities are primarily volunteer. The effect is really through Free State Project participants. So the Free State Project doesn't do the work that the participants do. And we have 4,000, if you want to use Jason's number, let's say 4,000 um, friends and participants, or 1,500 movers, or 17 or 1,800 in-state participants, however you want to count them, but numbers of in the thousands of people who now live here and are, let's say, full-time. Now, the, you know, at the beginning I said live life. We all have to live life, so it's not that we're actually working full-time as activists, but many of us, or most or all of us, are working at least part-time doing something. And that's not counted in the Free State Project budget. Um, you know, we may work in, I, I fly airplanes for a living, and, 
you know, Jason teaches and so on and so forth. We all have jobs or businesses or whatever it is we do, and that's all on our own. If you add up the value of that, it's, it's enormous, but we don't really have any way to account for that. Um, so the Free State Project is more like it's a catalyst, and as a catalyst, it's extremely effective. Now, you could argue that Cato is a catalyst as well. They raise millions and gazillions of dollars every year, and they write policy papers and go to Congress, and the pur purpose of the policy paper is to persuade congressmen. So that's a catalyzing effort as well. And if you put us on the same playing field there, we're certainly way more effective. Um, there have been countless, again, I couldn't, I couldn't mention them all, countless changes to law here in New Hampshire that have occurred because of the activities of free staters and measuring that against the budget of the Free State Project, which is really not exactly accurate or, or fair, um, results in a pretty substantial effect. So that's, yeah. that's kind of my answer. Well, if you want hard numbers, so uh, if you exclude Liberty Forum and, and Porkfest, which are self-funding most years, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the Free State Project's annual budget is about 60000 That's you know, year after year. Uh, compare that to 10 to 15 million for Cato Institute, uh, 2 to 5 million for Institute for Justice, I think Students for Liberty is 1 to 2 million, Josiah Bartlett Center for Public Policy here in New Hampshire is 250,000 a year, and uh, about, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, we did a study of um, local government savings, budget savings, that could be directly attributed to the participation of free staters in town meetings. And that figure was in the millions at that point. That was, that was seven or eight or nine years ago. That was before the State House budget, which from yes. uh, 08, 09, was it, or 10? I forget which session it was. Yeah, so it doesn't include anything at the state level, doesn't include anything that's happened locally since, doesn't include any of the personal freedom stuff that people are involved in. So it's, the bang for the buck is huge. And it's not just a redistribution of effort from other parts of the country to New Hampshire, because people get active in a way that they wouldn't have been. If you're in Texas, I'm outvoted. I can't do anything you know, that's of any significance. So I'm not going to be active if I move